before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm quite excited today. I, admittedly, I say this every day, but I am a history nerd because we've done the first crusade, haven't we, Zach? And we've done some broader crusade stuff, like we've done uh, like individual sieges and things like that, haven't we? But we found something that I don't know anything about this one. I'm a moron when it comes to this. So this I, is good. Yeah, I love this one. Um, this is, you know how on History Hack we love to do what we call shithousery? Yes. This is this is a uh, this is uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is as close as the Crusades get to shithousery. You're gonna you're gonna see some revelations today because we are joined by Jonathan Harris to talk about the Fourth Crusade. As you say, we've done the first. We kind of touched on the second when we were talking about Eleanor of Aquitaine a few weeks back. Uh, but Jonathan's going to take us through the fourth because Byzantium is kind of really key to what happens. No spoiler alerts going out. Um, so Jonathan is Professor of History at Royal Holloway and is an expert on the history of Byzantium and the Crusades. He's the author of The Lost World of Byzantium and Introduction to Byzantium 602 to 1453. Jonathan, great to have you back. We loved your last one on kind of Byzantium generally. How are you doing? Uh, hi, Alex and Zach. Yeah, I'm fine. Looking forward to talking about the Fourth Crusade. This is good, isn't it? Because so we gave you such a broad remit that poor you um, were trying to cover like 600 years of history in one podcast last time. So we said to you, come back and talk about something specific that rocks your world. And you've picked this. Uh, yeah, this is much more specific. Yeah, we're just talking about the run up to 1204. Brilliant. So how, how we got to Crusade number four? We did number one. We know what that was all about. Um, but how do we get to four and what are the aims by now? Is it the same concept and why is this one meant to be different? Uh, well, let's see. Now, we had number one, then we've got Jerusalem. Uh, number two goes out to kind of bolster the Latin position in, in the east. Uh, well, then, of course, there's meltdown in 1187 when the, the, the Franks lose the Battle of Hattin and consequently Saladin retakes Jerusalem. Um, so they come hurrying back with the Third Crusade, this is the one uh, that Richard the Lionheart's involved in, to get Jerusalem back. And they nearly do. Uh, Richard's army is, is basically within striking distance of Jerusalem. And he, he, he sort of thinks about it and he thinks, well, actually, no, because if I take Jerusalem, am I going to be able to hold it? I don't have the resources. Um, to actually fund a garrison, a permanent garrison that we need. That's always been the problem for the Latins in the East. There just aren't enough of them. So he ends up making a treaty with Saladin and going home um, with a view perhaps of coming back with some plan to keeping Jerusalem permanently in Christian hands. Well, he never comes back because he gets shot with a crossbow bolt um, not so long afterwards. Um, but in 1198, they preached the Fourth Crusade, uh, this is Pope Innocent III, and this time they've got a plan about how they're going to keep Jerusalem permanently. What we're going to do, we're not going to do a frontal attack. We're not just going to land in, in, in the Holy Land and, and march straight on Jerusalem. No, we're going to be clever. We're going to sail to Egypt. And when we get there, we're going to conquer the place. And Egypt is kind of rich. So um, that will give us all the resources we need, uh, all the supplies, all the wealth, um, ultimately then to move on to the Holy Land, take Jerusalem, and actually provide for its permanent defense. Um, because defending Jerusalem is difficult. It's got no, it's got no natural defenses. It's just sitting there. Uh, apart from its walls, that's all it's got. So we need, need a big garrison, and we need a way of paying for it and supplying it. And that's what Egypt will do. So that, that, that was the plan behind the Fourth Crusade straight away from the beginning. I love the overambition of this. You know, oh, we're, we're just going to take Egypt. It'll be fine. I've, I've got, I, I know I shouldn't make parallels with Napoleon, but I'm, I can't resist. <laughs> because, you know, just this, this sense of, yeah, we'll take Egypt, we'll use it as, as a base, it'll be fine. Okay, it kind of works out for Napoleon, but, you know, that's another thing entirely. Yeah. Um, but just the overambition. Is there any sense of just the scale of what they're trying to achieve here? Or are they still kind of stuck in that mindset of, we made the first crusade work, so, you know, things are possible? 
I think you know, you've got a good point there. Um, there is this kind of perception, well, you know, since we're, our cause is so totally just, um, you know, God will provide. But the, they had tried to conquer Egypt before and hadn't done badly. Uh, when it was under the Fatimid regime, um, and they captured Damietta at one point, um, and so perhaps they felt, you know, one last heave and we'll do it. Um, that was the plan, I think. Uh, maybe they underestimated the kind of resistance they would have encountered had they landed there. So this crusade, it goes wrong pretty much from the word go because they overestimate how many people are going to turn up. So my first question really is, why don't more people heed that call? Is there kind of a crusade weariness by this point? Um, I get the impression that actually there's still a great deal of crusade enthusiasm. And um, quite a few people did answer the call. The thing is, not all of them joined the main army. Um, I think word had leaked out that it was going to go to Egypt and not straight to the Holy Land. So a lot of people, oh, I know, I don't, I don't fancy it's going to Egypt. It doesn't sound like either the proper crusade. I want to go actually to the real Holy Land. That's what crusades are about. So a lot of people never went to Venice where the army was assembling. They all headed off to other ports. A lot of them went to Bari um, and embarked from Bari for um, the Holy Land. And so that is, is why people didn't, didn't turn up. In fact, um, you, you, uh, in the sources, it says, I think one, uh, one of the leaders, Louis of Blois, was on his way to Bari and he's sort of intercepted by the other crusade leaders. He says, no, no, they say, no, no, don't go there, come to us. Um, but when they, they did arrive, yes, that was a problem. There weren't as many um, of them as they were expecting. And um, the fact is, crusaders paid their own way. Um, I think people were surprised to learn this. If you went on crusade, you literally had to provide um, all for your own sustenance during that time, and you're expected to pay the fare um, to get you to Egypt. So there aren't, there aren't enough people there, enough bodies, all putting their, 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 their silver coins in the hat, actually to raise the, the fee that had been promised to the Venetians for um, putting this large fleet together, because you need a very large fleet to carry uh, all these um, knights and their horses and all their followers. <laughs> I love it. I love that it just, it sounds like the worst coach holiday ever. It's like, come crusade with us. There's a threat of death and you've got to pay your own way. Yeah. I mean, that's going to take some pretty massive amount of faith to convince you that that's a good idea, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I buy into the, the, the sort of Jonathan Riley Smith thesis that the main motivation here is always going to be spiritual. Uh, it, misguided perhaps, but the payoff is if you die, you go straight to heaven. No hell, no purgatory, uh, straight through the pearly gates. And, and that's worth every penny it costs. But that's the only reason to do it. Very few people get rich on crusade. They, they really don't. One or two do, but most don't. So explain to people then why all of this nonsense at the beginning with the fleets and Venice um, and a lack of appreciation for setting it up properly ends up derailing the whole thing? Well, the people who get, often get the blame are the Venetians. Everyone says, oh, it's the evil Venetians. They had a plot to take it to Constantinople because they, they wanted to take revenge on the Byzantine emperor because in the past they'd had a trade dispute. Um, I think that's rather unfair. The thing is about the Venetians is they live by trade. That's the only, their, their only source of income. And um, in accordance with the request of the Crusaders, they've literally laid up their merchant fleet, converted it so that it could carry horses, um, had it all ready there, so they'd foregone that year's trade, uh, which put them out of pocket. And then suddenly the Crusaders said, well, actually, um, we haven't got enough. We haven't got the, the money that, that we promised you. So the Venetians were put in a, a very difficult position. Um, secondly, it's not the Venetians who proposed that the crusade go to Constantinople. They didn't come up with the idea. The person who came up with the idea was actually a Byzantine. There's a Byzantine um, prince who's um, wandering around in exile in Italy, having, having uh, run away from the political situation in Constantinople. And he approaches the crusade leaders, not the Venetians, the crusade leaders, and he says to them, uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you use your fleet um, come to Constantinople with me, restore my father Isaac to the throne. He's languishing in prison, having been overthrown by his brother. Um, and then I'll pay you 
um, everything you owe the Venetians and more. So this guy has provided a solution to the problem. Now you can pay the Venetians, just come with me, it will all be um, uh, sorted out. And then when you've restored my father to the throne, then you can head off to Egypt, um, richer for large amounts of gold coin, and you can have your crusade and uh, everything will be fine. Um, it's a wonderful offer. It's not surprising that the crusade leadership accepted it and that the Venetians accepted it because the Venetians now have a chance of, being, of actually being paid and recouping their losses. I feel lied to. I did this at A-level and we were kind of given this thing of the Venetians, horrible people, they take the crusaders, they stick them on this sort of flea-ridden, disease-infested island and basically told, well, you're not going to have enough food until you agree to this. And I, I, you've just blown my understanding of the, what, why the Fourth Crusade happens apart. That's, uh, that's something, I guess, every day is a learning curve. Uh, it's an old and discredited theory that used to be around. There was a, a German scholar called Karl Hopf in the ninth, uh, 19th century who discovered um, that the Venetians had a treaty with the Ayyubid Sultan of Egypt, uh, signed in 1202. So he deduced from that that the Venetians wouldn't have wanted the crusade to go to Egypt because it would mess up their treaty. Um, and it's a wonderful theory. Uh, it just had one small flaw. Um, he'd misdated the treaty. The treaty When's it from? Is 1212. Which is actually after the fourth crusade. So nice idea, Professor Hopf, but um, no. Um, and so it was discredited, but that was in 1877. And yet this, the, the sort of ghost of this theory still haunts class A level classrooms. Obviously, it would, it would sound like, and um, yeah. So I'd be aware of it. I'm I'm a, a great defender of the Venetians. Um, yes, so you certainly they could have their moments, but I think in 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 for this particular uh, accusation, I don't think it sticks. You say that, but you also said that. So people, faith has to be the overriding. Um, Yes. conviction doesn't it to get you to leave your home in France or Britain or whatever um, and go to the Holy Land on crusade and yeah. yet for Venice yes. this whole idea of just popping along and sacking Constantinople uh, this does have ulterior motives doesn't it because they are near neighbours it's is this an opportunistic move by them to sort of jump on the idea of a crusade um, in order to strike a powerful blow at a rival in the eastern Mediterranean well, or am I not giving them enough credit yeah, no, you can't rule it out, that's the point. The thing is, is, they just signed a treaty with the Byzantine Emperor. Okay. Oh, yeah, outrageous one, 1198, giving them everything they wanted, free access to every port in the Byzantine Empire, no customs duty, no taxes to pay. Um, why would they have needed to attack Constantinople uh, at that point? Um, certainly, they've had trade disputes in the past, but at that point, they've actually got a firm treaty in place which would obviate the need to attack Constantinople. So I don't see any motive for it. So when the news breaks among the Crusaders that, you know, hey up guys, we're, we're just gonna do a little detour, you know, you booked the holiday to Egypt, but actually we're stopping off on Constantinople. It's, you know, maybe, a, a, I don't know how many hundreds of miles, maybe even a thousand miles yeah. out of the way, but it, it's all right. You know, yeah. we're, we're gonna get there. We, you know, <laughs> what kind of an impact does that have, particularly on morale? Do you see, an inclination at this point to give up and go home, or do people stick with it? Uh, lots of people are horrified. You know, yes, you say, we didn't sign up for this. You know, they hit the holiday to Egypt and actually we're going to Constantinople. No, I mean, it's, it would be greeted in pretty much the same way as, you know, you're in a mid-air flight, you know, on your way to the Costa del Sol and actually we're going to Siberia. Uh, no, it, it's not going to go down well. And um, there's a virtual mutiny. Um, and some, of the le some people um, leave. So Simon de Montfort, who's later to turn up on the Albigensian crusade, um, he ups with his followers and they go to Hungary and they make their own way to the Holy Land. Um, now, a lot of the poorer knights couldn't really do that, um, but they're still very upset. So what happens is the crusade leaders, the ones who want to go to Constantinople, um, they sort of gather them all together in a meeting and then they fall on their knees and burst into tears. And these guys are very secure in their masculinity. So, you know, tough guys are allowed to cry. So it's, it's all right. So a lot of crying goes on in, in the fourth crusade. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, the tougher you are, the, the more you cry, really. And so they're, they're blubbering away on their knees. And of course, it's emotional blackmail. 
And so the, the, all the recalcitrant Jews, they say, oh, all right. And they promise them, look, we'll just go to Constantinople, get the money, stick the guy back on the throne, then we'll go to Egypt, and then we'll go to Ho the Holy Land, and then you'll get to the Holy Sepulchre. And so finally they talk them out eventually. They're not happy. I'm just I'm not surprised. It's like you say, I'm, I'm ready for pyramids and stuff. I don't want to go to Siberia. This sucks. Uh, but they do sell for Constantinople. Um, how do the Byzantines react when they arrive? This is another of the weird things about the, the Fourth Crusade. You'd think, you know, that, that there would be absolute consternation. Here's this great big fleet full of heavily armed knights arrived on our doorstep. Um, it's a threat. And certainly they uh, immediately put the defences in order. But actually, most Byzantines seem to be incredibly laid back. Uh, and one of the extraordinary things is the lack of resistance, really, to the Fourth Crusade. The Byzantines do not put up a determined fight. Uh, when there is a fight, they usually come run away. Um, and the reason behind this is most Byzantines have seen this before. Um, Byzantine politics are fairly cutthroat. Um, if you're, if you're uh, a Byzantine emperor, you're, you certainly have to have your wits about you because there's always somebody looking to boot you off and take your place. Um, and what often happens is somebody who wants to take your place will turn up with an army of Western knights um, because they're the best soldiers there are in the world. Uh, so if you want to win, win the throne, they're the people you need. I mean, it happened in 1081. Uh, the Emperor Alexius I seized power in 1081 using an army of Western European knights uh, and basically bribing somebody on the inside to open the gates of Constantinople and in they went, the other guy gets overthrown. So that's what's happening now. So most Byzantines sort of look, at, look out from the battlements and see the fleet and say, aye, aye, here we go again. Um, okay, so maybe the Emperor Isaac will be restored or maybe his brother, the Emperor Alexius, will remain on the throne best thing for me to do is just keep my head down. And then when the outcome is clear, I'll cheer very loudly and say, I was on your side all the time, uh, so let's just see how it goes. So Byzantines don't see this as an attack by an enemy. They see it as an internal matter, uh, as kind of internal civil war. So they, they're just gonna sit this one out. It sounds sensible, to be honest. I think it's amazingly sensible. It's not very heroic, but it's certainly, certainly sensible, <laughs> yeah. A good route to survival, isn't it? Yeah. I'm always curious about that kind of initial moment, though, because Constantinople has kind of been a, a, a key staging post, if you will, on that kind of route of pumping various crusading movements. And, and we talk about first and second crusade, but actually it's it's a, a much bigger entity and you've got sort of mini crusade, you get people's crusade and so on and so forth. So is there initially a kind of thing of, oh, well, some crusaders have oh, you, you actually want to attack us this time. Is there a kind of a moment like that? Well, the Byzantines had always been pretty wary of, of the other three, because numbers one, two, and three had, you know, parts of number three had passed in Constantinople. And every time there was tension. And sometimes there were some actual um, physical conflicts between Byzantine troops and, and Westerners. So that's nothing new. Uh, and in fact, the Byzantines were pretty convinced that uh, earlier crusades had wanted to attack Constantinople. They're always convinced that everyone wants to attack Constantinople, um, and they say so. So um, they are perfectly well aware that these crusaders may well want to attack Constantinople, but they feel very secure behind their defences. Constantinople is a difficult place to take. Um, it's surrounded, you know, both on the landward and the seaward side by a very stout wall. Um, there's a chain up to stop the uh, Crusaders getting into the heart with the Golden Horn. Um, so they probably thought, well, you know, let's just sit this out with a bit of luck. Um, either they'll put Isaac back on the throne or they'll get bored and they'll just go away because the others all went away sooner or later. So let's just wait and they'll just go away. And so how does the siege actually end up playing out? Well, the Crusaders arrive and they do what you always do in these kind of standoffs. You make a show of strength um, and see who breaks first. Uh, and actually, it's the, the other emperor, Alexius, who breaks first. Uh, the Crusaders land, they dismantle the, golden, the, the chain over the Golden Horn, they get their fleet in, and Isaac, sort of, uh, Alexius, thinks to himself, hmm, I don't think I'm going to win this one, so he runs away. 
So um, the court, the palace in Constantinople sends a message across to Crusaders saying, okay, you win, send Isaac across, we'll restore Isaac, send, send the renegade prince over as well. Um, and so Isaac is now in, in charge, so the Crusaders have done what they said they would, and so then they submit their bill. And the Byzantine emperor, Isaac, who's restored to the throne, says, yes, this is what we promised. There's one small snag. Um, what I, what my, my son didn't realise when he promised you all that money is actually we don't have that much money. Here's what we want, <laughs> but um, that's only a fraction of what you want. So um, actually, um, you're going to have to be patient and wait while we gather it. Um, and the Crusaders didn't really have much choice at this time. And they, the time is getting on. They know that September is the last moment they can go to Egypt. We're now in, in July 1203. Um, so they wait, but September comes and goes, and still they don't get their money. And they realize now they're going to have to stay there the winter, because you can't make the voyage over the winter. So they wait over the winter, and still the money doesn't come. And so by early 1204, the Crusaders say, the hell with it, this is never going to happen. There's only one way we're going to get our money, and that's attacking Constantinople. And that's what they do in April 1204. Um, and they managed to get in through the sea walls on the on the Golden Hall in the harbour. And um, yes, the rest is history. They uh, they proceed to capture the place and sack it and loot it uh, for all the money they didn't get um, from uh, the emperor. So they end up with far more uh, riches than they they, they had dreamt of. And that sacking yeah. is. We talk about how there isn't vast amounts of resistance to. That initial part of the siege but when it comes to the sacking is there a fight for that or is this a case of the new guy is kind of was reliant on the franks to be put on the throne and so there just isn't that kind of security and dedication amongst his troops to resist the crusaders well once again in, in 1204 just as much as the previous year the, the resistance is is fairly lackluster um, and in fact, when the Crusaders get in, they find themselves met with a delegation of local Byzantines, um, all shouting, long live the Emperor Boniface, because Boniface is one of the, the leaders of the uh, Fourth Crusade. So for a lot of Byzantines, all that's going to happen now, OK, we're not going to have Isaac, we're not going to have Alexis, we're going to have Boniface. Who cares? Long live the Emperor Boniface. You know, it, it's, um, and, when, you know, eventually when the, 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 the Crusaders do elect an emperor, they, they elect actually Baldwin of Flanders. And there's plenty of Byzantines in the audience saying, long live the Emperor Baldwin. Um, as far as, there's still people who think that all that's happened is we've just got a new emperor. And he happens to be called Baldwin now. He used to be called Isaac, but now he's called Baldwin. That's fine, long live the Emperor. Can I ask what it's like for your everyday crusader who's not at sort of the top level of the negotiating table thinking about like when the money's coming? What if you're just some poor schmuck, for want of a better word, from France who's trekked all this way and is sitting there thinking, okay, we haven't been paid yet. I don't know what's going on. Uh, are we getting our money? Are we staying? Are we going? I mean, do we have any evidence as to their experiences? Well, luckily and unusually for the Middle Ages, we do, because um, there was a man called Robert of Clary, who was precisely a poor schmuck from France. He's a knight from near Amiens, um, and he's, he's written his account, and it, it's interesting, philologists love this work, because it's actually written in the dialect of Picardy. It's the only evidence for um, the kind of French they spoke in Picardy um, in the early 13th century. Um, and so here's his account, and he's very much, yes, he's exactly... Uh, as you say, what's going on? He's sort of sitting in the camp and they're being, being told all these things. Um, he's not happy about going to Constantinople, but he does. Um, when they're about to attack Constantinople in April 1204, he and others suddenly say, hang on, this isn't right. Surely we're crusaders. We're supposed to be defending the church and fighting infidels. The people in there are Christians. Um, and but then the, the clergy come along and say, don't worry, guys. Um, they're schismatics. Uh, there's a schism between the Church of Rome and, and, and the Church of Constantinople. The Orthodox. It's basically, a, we had a word with God, and He says it's fine. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. so, well, you know, God, 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 you know, yes, uh, uh, had a little whisper in my ear. Yes, and um, and because I wear a robe and I look the part, uh, you must believe me. And of course, they do. They're, they're, you know, rather endearingly. But the most, the most thing about that he tells us really is about things like half the time they didn't have enough to eat. 
Uh, I was going to ask about yeah. camp conditions. So, I mean, I'm guessing that this isn't going to be set up great, is it? Are we talking lack of sanitation, death from disease? Yeah. Is there enough food? Well, you know, you know, all, all tick all the above. And the main thing he talks about is, is lack of food, because effectively going to Constantinople was a choice between eating and starvation. If you go to Constantinople, you'll eat. And certainly um, food when they arrived was provided by the Byzantine emperor. Um, but of course, that, that, those supplies were cut off. Yeah, um, when know, they started attacking him, I guess, I'm giving you dinner <laughs> now. <laughs> you know, you're not getting anything. So basically the Crusaders have to capture Constantinople or die of starvation. Um, he's very good, he, gives us the, he, he tells us how much it costs to buy a chicken, how much it costs to buy a, a loaf of bread, and the prices were astronomical. So effectively, you know, that's what's driving them forward. Um, starvation is a, a very powerful uh, motivating factor. So, uh, no, it is wonderful that we have Robert of Clara. He's a great read. Um, and, uh, yes, highly, highly, highly recommended. So what's the mood like in terms of, you know, kind of dedication to this? So that they, you know, they turn up at Venice. No, sorry, guys, we're not we're not going to Egypt right now. We're going to Constantinople. So you, you go to Constantinople. Yeah. Then it's all right. We're going to be gone by September. We'll get to Egypt. It's going to be fine. You know, this holiday is going on for a heck of a long time. If we kind of take this analogy and, and just yeah. utterly indulge it. Yeah. By 1204, yeah. what's the mood like? Because they've taken Constantinople. You know, do, do these people ever get to Egypt? Have they just given up by this point? Are they thinking, well, hell, to hell with it. I'm going home. I'm going to make my own way here. What, what's the, the mood? Well, I think after they've captured the city, um, they realise we're not going to Egypt now. Um, so what we'll do is we'll write to the Pope, think the leadership, and we'll give him a kind of sanitised version of what has happened. And with a bit, <laughs> with a bit of luck, um, he'll give us his blessing. So they do. And the Pope writes back and says, this is marvellous news. What a, what a great job you guys have done, because now the schism between the Orthodox and Catholic churches is resolved. So I hereby do give you my blessing to stay in Constantinople. And if you stay in Constantinople and defend it against any attempt by the Byzantines to get it back, you'll get the same remission of sins as if you went to the Holy Land. So you need to go now. Well, fancy that. Yeah, so, so that was the way it was done. Um, Poor old innocent, he didn't actually realise uh, what had happened in Constantinople. Later on, he finds out that the Crusaders had actually uh, looted and ransacked churches, even though they're signed with a cross. Uh, and, um, but by that time, it was too late. He'd already given them his blessing. So they never get to read it. So Baldwin, yeah, this... You're not going to worry about that. Like, where's the small print? Did they not, like, the small print just keeps changing on this crusade? Oh, well, it's, it's like Animal Farm and the Cow Shed, isn't it? You keep changing the, you know, the rubric to, uh, to whatever suits you, yeah. And people like Robert of Clara, who can't read anyway, um, he had an amanuensis to write his, his memoirs. Um, what, what can he do? You, it, it's, it, it's the same old thing, really. So this Baldwin, who becomes, you know, we, we've gone, we're now a, a Emperor yeah. Baldwin. What happens to him and his regime? D does that endure? Or is this kind of the same story of Byzantine history that, you know, he's got to look over his shoulder, somebody else comes along and, and off he goes? Well, the Latin Empire that's set up in, in 1204 with this Baldwin as emperor, it's one of the great sort of might have beens of history, really, because it never really takes off. I mean, it could have been a new era, a new kind of Latin Byzantine empire um, with you know, sort of um, revived. And, um, but it wasn't. Unfortunately, what happened is, is early the following year, they got into a tussle with the, um, the Tsar of Bulgaria. Uh, and the Bulgarian Tsar had very, very cannily recruited a large number of Turkic horse archers. Um, so they meet at a battle near Adrianople, and these heavily armoured knights in their chain mail, they've, they've never encountered horse archers before. And so they laugh at them, because they're, they're these, these little men, you know, wearing leather jerkins on small ponies, and they thought, oh, well, we'll finish them off, you know, one charge, and, and they'll be out of the way. So they charge, and of course the horse archers do their, their favourite tactic, which is a feigned retreat, and then they wheel round and just uh, shoot off arrow after arrow after arrow, and uh, the knights go down one after another, and um, at the end of the day, um, the Bulgarian Tsar has won. He even captures the Emperor Baldwin. 
he takes Baldwin off to his capital of Tarnavo, and Baldwin is never seen again. Um, and from that moment, uh, really, the Latin Empire never really uh, takes off. Um, Baldwin's brother Henry does manage to pull the fat from the far from for a few years, but it, it was terminally weak virtually from day one. And um, in 1261, the Byzantines come back, reconquer Constantinople, um, reconstitute their empire pretty much as it was before 1204. It's sad, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> what a waste of time on everyone's part. Sure. Total of all that effort, all that you know, death and destruction, much of the achieved, totally nothing. Yeah. So the wider impact of this crusade then is negligible, isn't it? Doesn't destabilize the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Mediterranean because they get it all back again. Well, they do, but I think the stuffing has been knocked out of Byzantium. Byzantium. Okay. It's um, it never is quite the same again. Um, for a little bit at the, you know, between about 1261 up to 1300, it can still look as if it's some kind of power to be reckoned with. But thereafter, it goes in, in, into terminal decline. By the middle of the 14th century, it's dead in the water. Um, it effectively couldn't defend its eastern frontier. And the Turks take advantage of that. Various groups of Turks, they um, occupy Asia Minor right up to the Sea of Marmara and the Bosphorus. Um, and then in, in 1354, one group of them uh, manages to get over and capture Gallipoli. Uh, and once you've got Gallipoli, you've got a foothold in Europe. Um, now, those Turks were known as the Osmanli Turks, um, or in English, the Ottoman Turks. And uh, this is the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, as they then go on to conquer the Balkans, as well as Asia Minor. And they um, ultimately replaced Byzantium in 1453 when they captured Constantinople. So I think maybe the Fourth Crusade may have had something to do with that development. Um, by weakening Byzantium, uh, it may well have opened the door for the expansion of Ottomans, of the Ottomans, and for, of course for Islam to, to enter Europe. And what's the, the kind of wider wider legacy, if you will, in terms of impact on crusading, because this isn't the last crusade by a long shot. Uh, I forget how many more there are, but there are a few more than this. I think, it's, is it seven that they got to in the end? Uh, there is this one called the Eighth, isn't there, which um, um, Edward the, the future Edward the First is on, isn't it? Yes, it depends. With all, I mean, a lot of crusade historians don't like these numbers because um, there's crusade expeditions are going on constantly. Uh, throughout the 12th and 13th century. We just pick those particular ones out, isn't it? But um, um, certainly on one level, as the 13th century goes on, you can see there's a certain uneasiness. Um, we didn't do a good thing, did, did we there? That was a Christian city um, that we attacked. We should have been fighting infidels and we treated it badly. Um, so later on, the Pope regularly issues um, crusading appeals for people to go to the aid of the Latin Empire. Um, so about, by about 1250, it's on its last legs, it needs help. Uh, and nobody goes. Uh, nobody answers the call. Um, and um, they, they want to go to the Holy Land. That's the place where you go on crusade. So the Pope hasn't won this argument that going to Constantinople is exactly the same as going to the Holy Land. It really hasn't. So in, in that respect, it does have a bit of an impact on, on crusade ideology. But you're right. The ideal itself does not die. Um, it remains um, something that people aspire to, even if they don't necessarily do it uh, throughout the Middle Ages. I mean, you look at 15th century England, um, Henry V, uh, Richard II, Henry VII, all said they wanted to go on crusade. Now, you might think that's some kind of propaganda move or it looks good, and I suppose it probably did, um, I'm actually um, perfectly prepared to take them at face value, because here they are living in 15th century England, which is remarkably like Byzantium um, in its um, sort of political volatility. Um, and um, what a marvellous way to escape from the ordinary grind of everyday English politics. Go out somewhere where you, the good is a good, i.e. us, the bad is a bad, i.e. them. Um, and there's none of this moral ambivalence, none of, none of this stabbing in the back, none of this worrying about whether you can trust people or not. You know who they are and you know who we are. And so I think it, it, as an ideal, um, it remains strong, really, and again, right into the early modern period. And in terms of logistics, are there any lessons learned in terms of, you know, 
what we did in the fourth just did not work. So therefore this time we're going to do things differently. Or is there just not the, the apparatus to kind of think in terms of different logistical strategies at this point? Oh, I think they do because both the fifth and the seventh crusade do follow the same plan and go to Egypt. Um, but um, the seventh crusade particularly, they made sure that the supplies were in place. So what um, the, the King of France, Louis IX, did before he goes on the Seventh Crusade to Egypt, he actually had supplies stockpiled on the island of Cyprus. Uh, so when they arrive, there's these great big piles of grain waiting for them so that we won't get into this situation. And of course, he used the resources of the Kingdom of France to finance it. So they had learned the finance lesson, um, but of course it, it, it goes horribly wrong because although Louis does manage to catch a Damietta when he tries to advance into the interior of Egypt, um, he is uh, defeated comprehensively at the Battle of Mansour and ends up a prisoner. Uh, so, which is probably what would have happened to the Fourth Crusade if it ever actually got there. Uh, so the lessons are, are learned. Just finally, uh, we, so my favorite character on earlier crusading stuff is Bermond of Taranto, he's yeah. brilliant. Uh, who are the standout characters of number four for us? Oh, right. Well, I suppose the, the, the most interesting person for me is probably Boniface of Montferrat. Mm. Um, he's one of the crusade leaders, um, and he's elected quite, he's elected because the original leader died unexpectedly. The Count of Champagne was going to be the leader. So they elect this Boniface. And Boniface knows almost from the moment he becomes um, leader that we're going to go to Constantinople. Um, because, you know, in Christmas of 1201, he'd met the Byzantine prince um, at the court of uh, Philip of Sweden in Germany. And they probably hammered out the deal there because Boniface knows perfectly well that the crusade is short of money. So he's probably largely the person who's, who's really behind the diversion, not the Venetians. Um, but he also knows that the Venetians, because they're cross uh, and, and haven't got their money, they insist on the crusaders uh, doing a little job for them. Um, they insist on the Crusaders going first to the town of Zara on the Dalmatian coast, which have revolted from Venetian law and basically restoring it to the Venetians. Uh, so Boniface makes sure he doesn't join the army uh, until afterwards, so that no opprobrium will attach to him. He's a very, very good politician. So he's got it all worked out. And a lot of people also thought that after 1204, after he was captured, he'd become emperor of Constantinople. It seems obvious, isn't it? Um, the trouble was, of course, um, he's Marquis of Montferrat, which is close to Genoa. So he's kind of connected to Genoa. So the Venetians blackballed him, effectively, and said, no, we're not electing him. So that's why they chose Baldur. So he ends up as King of Thessalonica instead as a kind of consolation prize. Um, but it's an interesting career working out what he's doing behind the scenes uh, and all his plans and how, of course, like everyone's plans are the force of say, uh, they went horribly. And that treaty that you just kind of blew my mind with and basically told my 17 year old former self uh, to, to rethink their entire understanding of the Fourth Crusade. What happens to that treaty after the Venetians have been responsible for the transportation of, of the Franks to Constantinople? Do they kind of go, see so that treaty was still good, are we? Is there a conversation like that that happens? Um, the, the treaty with the Venetians or the treaty with Alexius? The, the Byzantine prince. So the, the treaty between the, the um, Venetians and the Byzantines. Oh, the, 90, the 1198 one. Yeah, well, yeah. I think there's, uh, what they do is they renegotiate the treaty um, with the, uh, um, the Latin emperor of Constantinople who gives them a monopoly on the Constantinople trade. So they do even better because the 1198 gave them um, free access to Byzantine ports without paying um, any uh, customs duty. Um, but they had to share it with the Genoese and the Pisans, their, their hated rivals. Um, after 1204, they become most favoured nation uh, on, in trading terms, and uh, the Genoese and Pisans are largely um, excluded. So they have a monopoly. So the Venetians had a, a, um, uh, a vested interest in maintaining the Latin Empire, if, even if they can't be blamed for, for setting it up. Um, and the, the reason it lasted as long as it did was because the Venetians gave it naval support, uh, and that's what kept it safe. So, um, so the Venetians were opportunists. Once Constantinople was, was, was uh, in Latin hands, they took advantage of that. 
Jonathan, this has been absolutely fascinating. Alex, are you satisfied with the shithousery we've had today? It's brilliant. I love it. I, obviously, I would not have loved it if I was sitting outside Constantinople in December uh, waiting for my money. And uh, I mean, we all do freelance work here, waiting for my money. Like, I've done the work. Now give me my cash. I need to eat, please. I would not have been impressed. But seeing as it was nearly a thousand years ago, I think we can have a chuckle now, can't we? Yes, people, if you want to support History Hack, that would be uh, very kind of you. A shameless yeah. plug there. Yeah. <laughs> but Jonathan, seriously, thank you ever so much for this. So The Lost World of Byzantium and Introduction to Byzantium 602 to 1453 will be available via our History Hack bookstore. Links in the description, folks. Please do, please do go and buy. You support the podcast, but more importantly, you also support Jonathan because he'll get a cut of the royalties, which are meagre. Well, hopefully you'll get a cut of the royalties um and where else can people kind of stay up to date with you and your work uh let's see i i'm not a great one for twitter and social media i'm afraid i do have a website where i um a college website where i, I put up my latest publications if anyone is remotely interested brilliant and thank you very much for joining us again okay thank you alex and zach when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack. Or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.